Aloha kako, everyone. My name is Brianna Govea. I'm the program specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. I hope everyone has been staying safe and healthy. On behalf of the Hawaii State Judiciary, mahalo for joining us as we deliver our program outside of our typical in-person format. Tonight's program is the first in a series of events that the Judiciary History Center will host in honor of the 19th Amendment Centennial. It's astonishing to think that only 100 years ago, women with American citizenship secured the right to vote in political elections. Our guest speaker, Dr. Ralph Cam, holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and an MA in Public Relations from the University of Southern California. He's also the author of several books and journal articles that explore Hawaiian history and culture. In this webinar, he'll share with us an important part of the suffrage movement that's long been undertold, the life and legacy of Hawaii's own suffrage leader, Wilhelmina Dowsett. I want to thank Historic Hawaii Foundation for partnering us with us to deliver this program. To those of you joining live, I invite you to send in any questions using the Q&A button, and I'll read them to Ralph at the end of his presentation. And now, Ralph, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Brianna. So uh, today we look at the life of a woman, uh, Wilhelmina Kekelo Okalani Nui Woodman Dowsett, a Hapahali woman of German descent and an American citizen only because of the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom and annexation. And yet she fought for the equality of women through a multi-ethnic coalition. Uh, she was the founder of the National Women's Suffrage Association of Hawaii, the first suffrage organization in the territory. And yet, um, as Brianna mentioned, very, uh, her story is uh, very undertold. So we're going to be looking at her life and maybe reflecting on why there is that, um, that difficulty of learning more about her. Now, uh, as you see on the title slide, uh, we've spelled Wilhelmina with an E at the end. And that's, um, that's an ongoing question. Uh, that's how she had her name spelled on her marker at Oahu Cemetery. Uh, but I've seen it both ways in um, newspaper articles and also um, in uh, legal documents. So, uh, you know, which way do we spell it? I went with the, probably the original uh, spelling of her name, but uh, with an A also I've seen uh, quite often. Now you would think that a woman who was, who started an organization um, that had equality in mind would have been for equality, but um, <laughs> in actuality, she thought that a woman is man's superior. Uh, she said in a uh, newspaper article, I can speak for my Hawaiian sisters and I can say that in every way, the woman is man's superior. She will not only cast her vote fully as intelligently, she'll vote honestly. There isn't enough money in the world to buy her vote. And so we have here um, an expression of, that goes beyond equality. Now, what, what um, what shaped uh, Wilhelmina is um, something that uh, we'll look at during the, the course of this talk. Now she was born uh, March 28, 1861, uh, what in uh, the Kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, here we have a map, she was born in uh, Lehue, and here is a map that is in German. And one of the reasons why it's in German is there is a large uh, German population on Kauai that worked on the plantations there. So she was the, uh, the daughter of Herman Wittemann, a uh, businessman, and Mary Kaumana. Now, um, Mary Kaumana, only after the death of uh, Herman Wittemann, uh, did, um, was there an expression of more about the family lines. And so, there was uh, an article that appeared in the uh, Pacific Commercial Advertiser that uh, said that there's proof of royal lineage of Mrs. Wittemann 
suppressed during the life of Judge Wideman. And this genealogy was a genealogy that went all the way back, uh, back to uh, Papa and Wakea. So it was quite an extensive genealogy, um, as was the uh, course in those days. Uh, the genealogy, of course, was um, disputed by others. And so the um, people that disputed it included Elizabeth uh, Pratt, um, Lilia, Lilia Kalani, and uh, Lucy K. Peabody. So these were prominent um, individuals, um, Pratt and Peabody coming from the uh, Kamehameha line. Now, Wilhelmina was very well traveled. Uh, here we see in 1881, a picture uh, with her father. And this picture was taken in Bremen, Germany. So her, her social position as part of that family was um, quite a uh, top position within the society in Hawaii. And she had attended many social events uh, scheduled during the year. Uh, very fortunately, we have a, a picture of the Whitman family in 1886. And this is um, a picture of the family. Now, many of us have pictures like this at home. And one of the, one of the aspects of those pictures is uh, we look at them and we don't know who the people are. And that's one of the, the sad things that um, I see when I go and do research at the Hawaii State Archives, there are numerous pictures of people that uh, are not identified. And so uh, if, if uh, I could ask anything of uh, the people listening to tonight, um, if you have a, a special picture like this one, um, you know, you can uh, do a, a drawing with the, the faces uh, outlined and then put the names next to them. Now, um, you'll be seeing a number of the um, people that are in this picture mentioned later, later on, because besides uh, Wilhelmina, who is here, she also had a sister married to C.O. Berger. Uh, Berger was the man who demonstrated electricity at the Ilani Palace. And Another, Emilie, a wed businessman, Fred W. McFarland. And Emma married his brother, Henry McFarland. So how do we know the names um, of the family members in this picture? Well, fortunately for us, we have the names. Um, and these are, um, it's an example of the benefit of recognizing who the names of people are within these pictures. So Mrs. H. McFarlane here, Mrs. F. W. McFarlane here, and Mrs. C. O. Berger. And of course, Wilhelmina Wideman, who would later marry um, Jack Dowsett. So, and here you have the father and mother of uh, Wilhelmina and the other sisters and brothers. And the question is, how do I, I know this? It's because the family actually had a photo identification. And you can see all the names are positioned back to the photo. And so um, we, uh, we can trace the members of the family. Um, so these are the descendants of Emma and Henry uh, McFarlane. And then the descendants of Martha who married Charles Otto Berger. And then Wilhelmina who married uh, Jack Dowsett. And Emilie who married uh, another one of the McFarlands. Now, as I said, uh, the Widemans were um, in high society in Hawaii, and they lived in a residence that was, uh, was to the same degree as, as their family was. 
So this is a property that um, is at the corner of Baritania and Puno Street. So a number of the large estates had moved out of Honolulu proper and out to the, um, the area that is uh, out there on the plains. Now, as I said, uh, Wilhelmina was uh, Wilhelmina Wittemann, but on April 30, 1888, she was married in St. Andrew's Cathedral. Now, this is a, um, a modern picture of the cathedral, but the stonework is exactly the same as uh, was built back then. Uh, the first stage only came out to the first column, and then a second expansion occurred in 1888. So this is basically what the cathedral would have looked like uh, when Wilhelmina Dowsett was married there. Uh, the, the Anglican Cathedral was a national church, and the extension from here to here was the 1888 portion. Now, the, uh, the Dowsets were a prominent family, uh, descendants of an English sea captain. And the original Dowsett compound was located in Kapalama on what today is called a Kepo Lane. And this is right across the street from where Liliokalani and Princess Ruth had their homes. So the area on King Street um, in Kapalama is, a, um, is an area that uh, also had a number of um, people in high society. And fitting to the, uh, the wedding of someone in that uh, society uh, were the reception guests. So the reception guests included uh, their majesties, the king and queen. Now that would have been um, Kalakaua and uh, Kapiolani, Her Royal Highness Princess Luikalani, Her Royal Highness Princess Kaiulani, his Excellency Governor Dominus, who was the governor, but also the husband of Princess Liliuokalani. Um, A.S. Cleghorn, who was the father of Kaiulani. And they called, said a, num a large number of the leading residents attended the reception. You, of course, recognize their faces. Kapiulani and Kalakawa were among the guests. This is John Dominus here. Claycorn and his daughter, Kaiulani. Now that's the benefit. Um, we know these people because of the numerous photographs they had. We have another picture of the uh, Winneman family, uh, but this one did not have a key to it. So we don't know um, who all the individuals are in this picture. We do know that there are a number of musical instruments, so we can only assume that uh, the music played a prominent uh, position in their home life. And uh, Jack Dowsett here has a, a banjo. So we, um, we know that he probably uh, played that instrument, but only from the picture. It's only an assumption. Uh, Wilhelmina Dowsett is here with the umbrella behind him. Now the, um, the death of her father, Herman, uh, came uh, in 1899. And so this was a major um, a shift in her, her life. Um, but you can see from the family and the relationships and the networking that they did that uh, Wilhelmina came from a very powerful family both on the Whitman side and on the Dowsett side. Now, when, um, when her father died, uh, Hawaii was becoming a territory and the Organic Act was, um, was passed in, in 1900, organizing the territory of Hawaii. And in that, it said that first, be a male citizen of the United States. So that was the qualification for voting was being a male citizen. Uh, it wasn't only the Organic Act that did that, however. The, the Hawaii Constitution 
uh, also uh, restricted voting to, um, to men. So how does a woman in, in, uh, without a vote uh, get leadership and also um, influence uh, things in her society? Well, for Wilhelmina Dowsett, it meant being involved in um, charitable organizations. She was a trustee in the Kapilani Maternity Home. So this maternity home is located on Baratania uh, at Makiki Street. Uh, right now, there's a recycling um, trailer there. So the, uh, the lot has not been, um, has not been remembered as a, a place where royalty once lived. So you had um, a house on that site. It was the house of um, Kekaulike. And after her death, Kapiolani um, had the maternity home move into that uh, place. So she was a trustee at the home. She was also a treasurer. And uh, what the uh, treasurer uh, did was also uh, fundraising. So uh, they had uh, lunch tables, uh, lao lao tables, and funds from from those various um, things to help fund the uh, Kapilani Maternity Home. Now, this was not only um, not only fundraising for the home. She also dealt with uh, political issues. Uh, there was a dispute with the Board of Supervisors in 1910. Uh, the home asked for 50 cents per diem increase on county cases. Uh, there is a dispute with the Board of Supervisors. Um, the committee reported that they had seen Mrs. Dowsett, and you, you'll see her referred more to as Mrs. J.M. Dowsett. That was a uh, way of referring to women in those days uh, by the husband's name. Uh, so if you look uh, for Wilhelmina Dowsett, uh, rarely do you find her name stated in that manner. But she, she made a political compromise and was able to uh, make it so that the home's rate was paid eventually. Uh, next to the house that you saw earlier, uh, there was the uh, Kapilani Maternity Home Annex. This was the house of August Dreyer. Um, this house sold for 21,000 to the maternity home in May of 1919. So, um, Wilhelmina Dowsett was the treasurer of the, the home. And here's an example of um, the trustees will give a luau and foreign lunch on the 30th of November. So she was not only member of uh, the Kapilani Maternity Home and their trustees, she also was a member of the Daughters of Hawaii. And this is uh, an organization that was a combination of women who were Hawaiian or Haole. And I think formed part of the basis of that multi-ethnic coalition that she used to pu push for suffrage later. You can see that the Daughters of Hawaii were prominent uh, on the society pages. They were responsible for getting title to Anayaka Malama, uh, popularly known as the Queen Emma Summer Palace. Uh, they did that in 1915. And they also had um, a benefit bridge in 1923 uh, to protect or preserve Hale Lama. Uh, in the background here, it was the Hale Pili of Kamehameha V that had been in Waikiki, was moved up to Nuuanu, and was uh, at, at the um, Queen Emma Summer Palace for a while. Now, you can see uh, the structure was uh, rebuilt here, uh, much rainier in Nuuanu. Eventually, they had to give the house to Kamehameha schools who brought it down to their campus on King Street. Um, the army took over the campus and after the war, uh, the house was not to be found. So sadly, um, that's an example of efforts to preserve that uh, get overtaken by other things. Now, her husband, was uh, in the Territorial Senate in 1905. This is Jack Dowsett. You can see Jack Dowsett here in the back. 
And the man that he is standing next to will play into the suffrage movement later. This is um, Senator Chillingworth. So her husband on the Senate, they still do, um, they're still doing philanthropic sorts of uh, activities. Uh, the Bishop home was at Kalapapa was presented with upright piano. She was also involved in government. She was a commissioner for public instruction. She's the one that got this book, uh, Geography of the Hawaiian Islands um, into the schools. And she also worked with the Outdoor Circle. Now, the Outdoor Circle um, vice president was Mrs. H.R. McFarland. Now, uh, that's her sister, Emma. And so you have, you have a, a familial um, network also within these various uh, charitable organizations. The Outdoor Circle, of course, you know, because they're the reason why we have no billboards in Hawaii. And the way that they achieved that was to um, threaten boycotts of products. Now, the billboards that we might have seen around today would have been like these um, large billboards. The Outdoor Circle also was uh, interested in beautifying Hawaii. And so you had the Wilhelmina Residence Royal Palms. Uh, they were proposed that the entire Baratania Street be an avenue of Royal Palms. That was a committee that she was on. And finally, we, um, we see the starts of Wilhelmina Dowsett's um, activities within suffrage. Now, the National Women's Equal Suffrage Association of Hawaii was established in 1912. And it was the first uh, suffrage organization in the islands, but very few people remember it today. Now, it was an affiliate of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was a organization that combined the, um, the two major women's suffrage organizations at the time. Now, Wilhelmina did not initially um, want to be in the leadership of this organization. Uh, I was asked by the women of the college club to take the initiative on this question, suffrage, but I said no. You take the initiative and I will work with you. But when my Hawaiian sisters came to me, I looked at it in a different light. They needed encouragement. So then I answered yes. That was in 1912. So uh, reluctant in one way, but also um, she was cast upon the stage from being behind the scenes to being the, uh, the leader within this movement. Now the movement, uh, she was called was a suffragist, not a suffragette because suffragettes were in England and they, um, they used violence in many um, instances to try to push forward this uh, movement. So the uh, organization that uh, she allied with was the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And if you look at the um, person in the middle, that is Carrie Chapman Catt. And Carrie Chapman Catt came um, to Hawaii um, and delivered a lecture on October 28th, 1912. But this became uh, very personal for Wilhelmina. Uh, at her uh, 25th wedding anniversary, she had um, an archway dividing the two rooms uh, with a banner that said votes for women. And it said that there was um, a very witty speech on her part later in the evening. And that's a sad thing about history. Um, we have no, um, we do not know what that speech was. Uh, in many cases in archives, you'll see uh, some people have a lot of information. So if, um, if anybody knows where some of the Wilhelmina Dowsett papers are, this certainly is an area that um, is ripe for additional research. So there was a, a mass meeting supported by Mrs. Dowsett and it wasn't for, um, wasn't for suffrage. It was to, um, to disallow legalized prostitution in Hawaii. 
And so you have these organizations getting together, the Outdoor Circle. Um, one of the events was a night in Roofland. And the people that were um, involved in that, uh, Mrs. Uh, J.A. Campbell, uh, Mrs. Charles H. Atherton. So you can see the names of some of the prominent leaders in Hawaii. Uh, Dallas had also sat, served on a uh, planning commission. And again, you can see the, um, the Honorable J.K. Kalananaole, Prince Kuhio. And you also have um, Mrs. F.J. Lowry of the uh, Outdoor Circle. So you can see this interlink interlinking of organizations. Uh, she also went beyond Hawaii. Um, there was a linkage with the national organization. And the, this took place, a lot of this took place during World War II. And you have uh, a German descendant, now an American, uh, serving on the uh, Women's Committee on, of the Council of National Defense. Uh, she was a temporary chairman at the request of the national organization in 1917. And in November, she was chosen as the permanent chairman. And one of the uh, areas that um, she worked on, and you know, you can see that in what we're facing today. Uh, today, we're having people sew masks for uh, the people within the hospitals. And then you had what was called the Hawaiian Knitting Unit. And they were uh, sewing, um, or knitting um, items for the Hawaii uh, soldiers who were involved in World War I. And one of the organizations uh, was the Daughters of Hawaiian Warriors. Here's a, um, a picture of the organization. And they were involved with the, um, the Red Cross Women's Department. Again, uh, other sorts of activities uh, associated with the war. You had the War Camp Community Service, um, sort of like the USO of the time for the leisure activities. You also had after the war, um, the War Memorial. So we know the Natatorium is the War Memorial here for World War I, but there was a proposal to have an auditorium at uh, Punchbowl and King Street. So that's where the territorial office building uh, is today. And you had the, um, the knitter's hard at work. Um, this picture of Wilhelmina Dowsett is identified as the president of the Hawaiian Knitting Union. So um, dressed to the nines. Now there was a bill in the US Senate that would make it possible for suffrage to occur in Hawaii. And this is Senate Bill 2380. And it provided that the legislature uh, is uh, hereby vested with the power to either submit to the territory the question or to um, empower just uh, suffrage to occur. Senator, uh, sorry, President uh, Woodrow Wilson signed it. So you had in uh, June of 1918, uh, the ability for this, the territorial legislature to uh, approve this. So here you have the 1919 Territorial Senate. And here you have the person that was standing next to J.M. Dowsett. Um, in the uh, 1905 picture we saw earlier. So you had the, besides the Territorial Senate, you had the Territorial House. And the society page said, uh, Mrs. Jam Dowsett, who heads the suffrage movement in Hawaii is a woman in whom confidence can be placed and with her at the helm, only good can result. Uh, what they did was uh, they, lobbied the legislature. And on March 18th, they had a women's suffrage meeting at a complex that uh, you probably pass by on King Street from time to time. Now, one of the key distinctions for these meetings was that there was multi-ethnic support. 
The march on the Capitol will be made by hundreds of women, Hawaiians and Haoles alike, all join in the sisterhood of suffrage. Um, nationality is a word which the women are eliminating from their plans. Women of Honolulu is the phrase used in spreading the call throughout the city. And the speakers that they had um, at those meetings were quick to point out the, um, the fact that the women of Hawaii were capable. If uh, the women of old Hawaii were capable, why not the highly educated women of um, the time then? And something that really uh, struck me was one of, the, one of the speakers said, the history of no other country shows as many great women as that of Hawaii. And I th when I read that, I thought about it. And you have so many of the, the queens and the Kuhina Nui who made major um, changes uh, in Hawaii, uh, very true. Unfortunately, even after this mass meeting, uh, the legislature was deadlocked. Uh, the Senate wanted to confer suffrage without referendum. The House wanted a referendum. Um, and in, in, in many ways, the House thought that perhaps this would die if we just uh, sent, it, sent the question to the, the voters. So the response of the deadlock uh, was that the, the women wanted to care, go beyond the local legislature, go directly to Congress. So Prince Kokio, who was um, on committees with uh, Wilhelmina Dowsett, uh, was, was going to um, carry the petitions and introduce a bill for suffrage. Now, with all this effort that Wilhelmina Dowsett was doing, you have very little knowledge of it today. And I think one of those reasons is that parallel to the efforts of Wilhelmina Dowsett and the other women uh, in Hawaii for suffrage was the ratification of the amendment that we celebrate the 100th anniversary of. So here we have the women sewing stars on the, the uh, suffrage ratification banner. They needed 36 states. So you see that some are still remaining, but on August 26, 1920, the approval of the suffrage amendment was announced. And because Hawaii was a territory of the US, women in Hawaii thus became able to vote. And so August 26th, you have the approval of the amendment. August 30th, you have people, uh, women registering to vote. And you might see fifth in line was the sister of Wilhelmina Dowsett. So you have uh, involvement at the family level once again. And again, you have the first voting occurring um, just a few months later. And one of the things that um, I enjoyed was they said that many of the women that went to vote for the first time were able to, um, were knowledgeable about casting their vote better than some of the men. Now, one of the uh, few artifacts that we have from this time was a symbolic ratification star. And this was sent up, it, the territory did, did not have the ability to ratify the amendment. And this truly was symbolic. And so they sent up this uh, star and the star was uh, from the Daughters and Sons of Hawaiian Warriors Society. And the yellow feathers signify wisdom and intelligence, the red love and patriotism. Now, the organization that sent it was a new society in 1917. Alice McFarlane, the niece of Wilhelmina Dowsett was um, one of the individuals, you know, in starting that. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the women that um, questioned the genealogy, Elizabeth K. Pratt, was also among the incorporators, along with Wilhelmina Dowsett, 
uh, spelled with an A here. The uh, organization that Wilhelmina Dowsett started became the League of Women Voters. And once again, they were involved in things like the Republican Convention. Uh, most of the people or most of the um, representatives in the legislature were Republicans at that time. You have the various annual, annual meetings of that organization and a luncheon for Rosalie Lyons Kalinoy. She was the first delegate, uh, woman delegate in the legislature. Well, I mean, it was also on the Republican platform convention. And here's Rosalie Kalinoy and in the session itself. And the members uh, planned for a membership tea to be held at the Dowsett residence on Puno Street. So Stainback uh, was governor uh, later. So here's a picture of the women, League of Women Voters at the membership tea. And here in the center is uh, Wilmina Dowsett. So you have her as uh, chairman, 1926. And she urged him at that time that each woman realize her civic duty and realizing them do her duty in taking part in public matters, even to offering herself as a candidate for office to promote clean government. Uh, sadly, three years later, uh, she died on December 10th, 1929, and she is buried at Oahu Cemetery. And on this uh, marker is the spelling with the E. Um, the Dowsett residence was on Puno, and you can see the style of the buildings, the, um, the royal palms there. Uh, it became the Shriners Hospital. It was deeded to them, and the Shriners were in there. And a prominent person came and visited that hospital, a man that had been uh, stricken by polio himself, and that was uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1934, his first visit here. Now, in, for a long time, um, Wilhelmina Dowsett has um, been in the background, I think, of mentions within history. And the book Notable Women of Hawaii did not have an entry for her, but I, I'm happy that uh, there has now been recognition for her. And so uh, she is going to be the 2020 honoree for the National Women's History Alliance. And the organization spells her name with an A, which E or A is perfectly um, all right. Um, but uh, they wrote that she was a fierce advocate for the enfranchisement of all women. I, I think it's um, an honor that's been long due. So now we're uh, open for questions if you have any and uh, hope I can uh, answer them. Mahalo Rao for sharing that fascinating history. Um, and I wanna say thank you too for your work in helping to raise awareness of Wilhelmina's story. Um, I think I speak for all of us when I say, um, I, I hope her impact continues to be a visible part of the women's suffrage movement. Um, and yeah, like you said, we can take questions now. I do have um, two questions, three questions. So I'll go ahead and start with the first. Um, I know you touched upon these um, first two questions briefly. Um, what do you think played a part in Wilhelmina's story not being a commonly spoken part of the larger suffrage movement? I think the primary reason why it um, has fallen along the wayside is that if, um, if the suffrage amendment had not gone through and the efforts of these uh, local organizations had resulted in the uh, establishment of suffrage in Hawaii based on those organizations, I think you would have probably had um, a greater remembrance of uh, Wilhelmina Dowsett's role in, in that process. 
but it's almost as if the um, the national suffrage um, national suffrage amendment almost took the sails out of the effort uh, the wind out, out of the sails of the effort in Hawaii. Mm. Um, we have a couple other questions that have just come in. Um, is Wilhelmina Rise in the Kaimuki, Kaimuki area named for Mrs. Dalsip? Uh, not to my knowledge. I believe that um, Wilhelmina was a um, daughter of uh, Matson, a Matson shipping line, which had something to do with that development there. But a good book for that, uh, probably if you looked it up in um, Place Names of Hawaii, by uh, Mary Kavena Pukui. It should have a, a reference to that there, but not to my knowledge. I don't, do not believe that, uh, well, I know that it's not, um, it's not named for Wilhelmina Dowsett. Okay. Um, another question, what were some of the challenges in uncovering Wilhelmina's story? One of the biggest challenges that I had was not having um, an archive that had her collected papers. And I do not know where the papers are. Um, I'm hoping some family member has them um, stashed away in a trunk and uh, is willing to bring those out. It's, um, I've done a lot of research uh, on the missionaries. Uh, one of the books I helped work on was called Partners in Change. It's an encyclopedia of the missionaries and they just wrote everything down. And all of those letters are now stored in the um, Hawaiian Mission Children's Society uh, archive. Uh, so it's, it's nice to see and touch um, pieces of paper that are some of them, well, it's a 200th anniversary of the missionaries coming to Hawaii. And they have journals uh, over that entire time. Mm. I, um, I found very little, um, well, I could not find um, primary documents written in Wilhelmina's hand, uh, other than the you know the legal um, legal documents that she signed. Um, but um, you know, a, a witty speech from that anniversary dinner that would that would be so rich to have as um, as information there. So um, it's um, it's not it's primarily not being able to find. The, um, the primary documents. But she has a very rich um, uh, trail within newspapers of the day. So, and a lot of them quote her. So I was very fortunate in that regard. Um, relatedly, someone has asked, are the Hawaii Suffrage Organization's papers held somewhere? That you I've, know um, the, the, main, the main place where it should be is the, um, Hawaii State Archives, but mm -hmm. uh, well, that that I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say should be. They're a government, technically a government archive, and that would have been a private organization. But um, you know, it's it's one of those things that it's nice to have research that is open ended. So uh, someday I know that um, I will <laughs> will find something um, additional to this story. Um, but there, there are other things that I've researched that I have not been able to find in years and years. Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone out there has a picture of Mulaulani, Queen Lili Okalani's house in Kapalama, uh, I would love to see that. That's a, a picture of a major home of Lili Okalani that was the British consulate that even with those, um, those uh, facts about it, I have not seen a picture of it. Mm. So some things aren't out there, mm -hmm. but I, I hope that there's more on Wilhelmina Dowsett that's out there. Um, I've gotten uh, some good information from Alan Dowsett. He said, in speaking to Wilhelmina's grandson today, Ian White, her correct spelling was always with an E. He has several old pics with Jack referring to her as Wilhelmina with an E. Um, and then he adds that Ian White may be a good source, Ralph, for you, and that he can put you in contact after this um, presentation. Um, someone also asked what your contact info is, Ralph, your email. So if okay. people want to um, follow up with you. It's a simple one. It's uh, cam, K-A-M, 
at hawaii.edu. If anyone um, needs that to be repeated, please um, email Judiciary History Center info at jhchawaii.net and I can send that along. Um, oh, but actually this makes me think our um, webinar is being recorded. So it will be up <laughs> um, right afterwards <laughs> for you to watch again. So no need to um, email. You can just forward to the part where we're at. Ralph just shared his email. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, another question. So we kind of touched upon this. People were asking about um, her children. How many children did Wilhelmina have? I believe she had four children. Um, I didn't really dwell upon the, the genealogy. I did the genealogy simply because um, the sisters got involved in so many different organizations and there were cross ties between the organizations based purely on the family. And you wouldn't know that they were related because they're all listed under their husband's names for the most part. So Mrs. C.O. Berger, Mrs. F. McFarland, Mrs. H. McFarland. So um, really, I, I just needed to put a tree out there so I could um, sort of follow the, um, the names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So yeah, thank you so much, Ralph. This has been really, really interesting. Um, we've had over 40 people attend our live webinar. So thank you for everyone who tuned in. Um, like I mentioned, we'll be posting this on our Facebook and YouTube pages as well as our website um, very shortly. So thank you. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Ralph, do you have anything to add? Uh, just thank you to the, the people who listen to this presentation. If anyone has any um, insights, please just um, email me. I would appreciate it. And thank you again for attending tonight. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I'll just share that we will have additional um, online programming being announced this week. Um, we're gonna be using this platform for as long as um, the pandemic is kind of uprooting our normal lives. Um, again, I hope you all are staying safe and healthy and thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Aloha. Aloha.